Hello, everyone. This is Eric Laser, and welcome to our live recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare, produced by Shared Purpose Connect. We bring leaders together each episode to not only inform you, our audience, but also to unearth bright spots, successes at health plans, at hospital systems, and other related healthcare organizations across this great country of ours. Our goal is to identify as many successes or bright spots as possible so that you, the listener, can determine if the ideas shared on today's episode can be applied at your organization. We believe that this approach of finding a bright spot and cloning it is the most effective strategy to improving healthcare in our lifetime. If you have not tapped into the wonderful toolbox of ideas, strategies, and tactics that this show, Bright Spots in Healthcare, uh, has uh, curated and put together for you, I encourage you to subscribe for free to Bright Spots in Healthcare, the podcast, wherever you consume a podcast, your Apple app, podcast app, Spotify, Amazon, uh, I could go on and on, uh, Stitcher, Google Play. It's where the, everywhere you consume podcasts, type in Bright Spots in Healthcare, subscribe, and you could see a whole belly of episodes with leaders at various different organizations in the health plan provider space, some innovators as well, providing all kinds of topical ideas uh, that are relevant today that may be able to inspire new thinking or even bring new ideas to your organization. Uh, so I encourage you to do all of that. It's less of me talking and all of our guests. Trust me on that. So subscribe to Bright Spots in Healthcare. Today's episode is compliments of our friends at Icario, Icario Health. If you've never heard of them, well, they are the newly formed company uh, that is a product of the merger between Revel Health and Novu Health. Uh, they are a health action platform that unites pioneering technology, data science, and behavioral insights. We'll talk a lot about that today to connect everyone to better health. I encourage you to check them out on their website, uh, IcarioHealth.com. Let me spell that for you. I-C-A-R-I-O Health.com. That's one word. Uh, check them out online. Uh, these, these actually are my words, not theirs, but I view them as one of the unicorns in our industry. And, and, and why do I? It's because they actually combine innovation with pragmatic non-healthcare thinking to drive better healthcare outcomes for all the people you take care of or you insure. And I'll tell you more about what I mean by pragmatic non-healthcare thinking later on in the show. We have a terrific panel uh, put together for you. Compliments of Sherry Keels behind the scenes producing this uh, program. She is actually gonna provide a link to their bios in the chat right now. We're gonna bypass the reading of their bios as we typically do to save time, make sure you have more time to hear all of the great ideas and programs that they are running uh, during the remaining 57 minutes or so uh, we have here. Also in about 45 minutes, you're gonna receive yet another email from me. It's gonna be a link to our feedback form. It will not be the last email you receive from me about this if you do not complete it. Uh, so to save yourself some litter in your inbox, please take the one to three minutes it will take to provide us feedback. We use this to drive our programming. We read every single one of them. I actually read every single one of them. And it's an important part of how we have grown this uh, program over the last seven plus years. You could suggest topics, guests, et cetera. And if you want to partner with us, like Acario Health is, uh, or another half dozen organizations are, you could actually uh, request to talk to me directly about that through that form as well. All right, let's, uh, let's get started. The title of today's session, Discover the Secrets to Building a Successful Medicaid Rewards Program. We are going to cover incentives. We're going to also talk about how to achieve meaningful activation. Our experts are going to share real examples of successful programs. We're also going to cover how to provider to uh, engage the providers in driving meaningful consumer activation uh, of your Medicaid population. We're also going to talk about building trust with those Medicaid members and the underlying theme around everything we're going to talk about today is how to individualize your marketing to these Medicaid consumers. And that all starts with design. So I'm going to throw out the first question here. I want to talk about how you approach designing programs. 
uh, that alter behavior or incite an intended behavior. So to do that, I'm going to bring in uh, two of our panelists, uh, Dan Weaver. He's the vice president of Medicare and Medicaid quality at Gateway Health. And uh, Corey Busi, who is the vice president of engagement strategy at Acario Health. So I'm going to start with you, Corey. How, how are you approaching the design of programs uh, that alter behavior uh, or incite uh, an intended behavior? Sure. Thanks. Good morning, Eric, and thanks for having us. Um, excited to be here. Um, you know, well, it, it, it really starts with data, right? Um, and, and so many things do these days. It, it all seems to start with data. Uh, but when we say that, what we mean is that we, uh, we recognize that most health plans are really, really good at knowing their members clinically. The data that they have in front of them, EMR data, uh, claims data, uh, the, the stuff that they, the underwriters and actuaries have, have passed on through, let them know those members pretty well darn well clinically, but we also know that motivating members to take action means uh, knowing those members personally uh, beyond just the clinical point of view. So by taking in that first phase of data from the clinical side from a health plan, um, most health plans have that in spades. And what we do is we take that and then we overlay with that um, third, party, uh, third party consumer data. This is the same data. These are the same data points uh, for 90 to 95 percent of the members that, that we engage with in any given Medicaid program, for example, that, uh, that Amazon is using, that Target's using, that Delta's using, that Starbucks is using, to, to, in order to, to do outreach and customized messaging to their membership at as close to an N of one level as they possibly can. So we're taking those uh, types of, of consumer level data so that we can get, you, you, you know the old, uh, the old saying, I can know more about your, your health by your zip code than I can by your genetic code. That is absolutely what we're talking about here. Because obviously, um, a Medicaid member who is in a, a rural area, has a rural zip code, and might be 40 miles away from a healthcare facility, is going to have different needs than a Medicaid member who is downtown with a clinic across the street. And so what we do is we try to utilize those data that we know about zip code, household income, pet ownership, those sorts of things that will have a direct and uh, a, a direct impact on a member's ability to seek care, to get care, their likelihood to engage with a program that uh, a health plan has put in front of them. So clinical data, uh, individual member data, and then we add on top of that what we refer to as our proprietary benchmarks. We've been doing this for a while. We've been doing this for about 15 million members across 40 health plans across the country in every state in Medicaid across the US. We, we kind of keep our own counsel and know what sorts of things are, uh, are working and what will motivate a member, not just to, to engage with a program, but to take the necessary action to close gaps in care, to become more satisfied with their health plan, to remain a member, to, uh, to, to, to uh, re-enroll year after year. Those are the sorts of approaches that we take. So before we send a single postcard or make a single phone call, we start with data. Can, can you provide a quick uh, example when you say that proprietary kind of data level that that uh, Acario is able to provide because of all the experience? Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll grab one that I that, that caught my attention. So um, uh, likelihood to uh, fill out a form or renew. I'm putting my, my words, not yours, um, that you just said. It, like, what would be an example of how you're able to find that data and then apply it to... Um, to a tactic or, a, or, or delivery? I'll, I'll, I'll speak to something that is probably key and on everybody's mind, which is the CAP survey. In, in Medicare and Medicaid, increasingly CAPS is becoming a huge component of what drives uh, health plan success and member, member satisfaction. What we know about survey takers is that survey takers are survey takers, right? So if you've got the, the uh, body of evidence that you've built through a pre-CAPS survey, for example, or a mock CAP survey, those individuals are more likely to be the ones who are downstream going to end up taking the survey that the official cap survey if and when they receive it. So it, it seems a, a little bit intuitive, but it's, uh, it's also a component of just knowing your membership and being able to identify something as simple as, hey, I activated, put up my hand, said, yep, I'll take your survey, took it, and now you have additional real-time actionable non-anonymized data about me that you can follow up on in advance of a CAP survey that when you receive it officially, you are more likely to take because you took the first one. So you'll be able to tell me who's gonna be able to fill out our survey at the end of the show. <laughs> exactly right. 
All right, that's great. So uh, let, let's bring in uh, Dan Weaver. Uh, Dan, how, how are you guys at Gateway Health approaching behavioral design? So uh, definitely everything that Corey just said, I, I would reiterate in second. Um, it really does come down to that ability to personalize and customize the approach. So um, what I'll say, um, you know, his comment about the zip code is really where, you know, we'll take that next. We are a regionalized plan, you know, focused within our state. So um, we really have a heavy community focus. And so a lot of cases, you know, it's uh, understanding that community, pulling in sort of, you know, I don't know if you want to call it business intelligence, but, you know, that sort of uh, information that you may not be able to get nece necessarily from larger data sets. Um, but really folding that in through, you know, localized resources, community partnerships, things like that. It's being able to understand what those members are at sort of that sub micro level and being able to engage them in the ways that they want with words and, and approaches that are meaningful to them. I use the word words there because it can be as simple as your word choice when positioning the information to them. Um, it can be whether you use natural language in your approach versus you use some interpreter service to translate something written in English, um, you know, writing in native language versus, you know, an interpreted language. Uh, we look at all of those things to truly personalize every message, every outreach and every community engagement down to that level to make sure that we're going to maximize their receptivity to the messages that we're showing, which can then help us, you know, move toward changing behavior. Uh, just a quick uh, PSA, I forgot, folks. I know a lot of you, when you registered, at least those who are here live, uh, when they you submitted questions, and there's a bunch of them I'm going to sprinkle into today's conversation. But if you want to ask an additional question or have not yet had a chance to ask questions, there's a Q&A module at the bottom of your Zoom interface. At this point, Zoom should be probably be a second language to you. Uh, please use that uh, to submit questions to our panel, and Sherry and I will track those and try to try to throw those questions into the flow of today's conversation the best we can. Uh, before we get into providing examples uh, of programs that are working, I wanna make sure we talk about the provider role in all this. So I'm gonna bring in Marty Jensen. He's the Senior Director of RIE Communications and Programs at an organization called Colorado Access. And Marty, I'd like to talk about how you're leveraging providers to drive that activation among your Medicaid population. Well, I, I think that, you know, everything that Corey and Dan said about zip codes and neighborhoods and, and that type of understanding on the member level also applies on the provider level. I mean, if we really want to be successful in engagement and driving health outcomes, we have to marry those two things at the start. Um, at Colorado Access, we're, we're building on our support and payment models, the data and understanding we're collecting from those things, and the things we've learned from COVID to identify and support providers who are located in engaged with and making a difference within distinct neighborhoods within our regions that show health disparities. And in doing this, we're asking ourselves, you know, at what point does a little bit more investment translate into a lot more return? And if we can spur that return on the practice level, it helps underscore and highlight the provider's commitment to the neighborhood and the people who live there, which builds trust and familiarity and leads to further engagement and better health, health outcomes in the long run. So as an example, Last year, COVID gave us a real urgency to get emergency funds out the door to support our provider network. And we did this in a series of funding waves. Now, the first two waves, we divvied the money up in a very traditional way. The size of the checks were based on the size of, the, of our membership on a provider's panel. By the time we got to the third wave, though, we really wanted to be more targeted with the money. We wanted to focus payments in neighborhoods that were being impact, hard, impacted harder by COVID. We wanted to support local providers in those neighborhoods. And we were also curious if there was a point, a threshold at which for smaller practices, especially our investments fostered longer term investment on the part of the providers that helped sustainably improve the system in those neighborhoods. So in short, fewer checks for larger amounts to specific providers in targeted communities. And, and we immediately saw a difference in our providers response to this third funding wave. You know, instead of responses like, thank you for thinking of us and we appreciate the help, we saw a commitment to deeper investment in services, utilizing our funding as leverage. One, one provider, for example, used the money as an impetus to build a separate permanent respiratory clinic on site so that members could access those services within their own neighborhood during COVID and even after. Other providers decided not to furlough staff and bring in additional staff because they were you know, now confident they could outlast and move forward in a better way from COVID. And, and, and the thing is, we're not talking about a lot of money. 
we're talking about the difference between maybe $15,000 and $50,000. You know, so anybody who's ever owned or operated a small business understands that investing in the future isn't just about money, though that's a big part of it. It's about confidence in the market and your vision and believing that you have the support and connections to be successful at executing that vision. And the sweet spot is where all these things align. And, and, and that's a huge lesson out of this. We didn't need to buy a respiratory clinic. We needed to help seed confidence in the future. And that's what we were purchasing with a little bit of extra money. That's what we were solidifying with our connection to the partnership with these providers. And that's what will lead to further change and engagement and improved health outcomes in these neighborhoods. You know, it's, it's I guess, just uh, echoing what Corey and Dan said as well on the provider side, it's no longer sufficient to define network adequacy in terms of regional ratios and time and distance standards. You have to, you know, you can have 8 million providers in your network and if people aren't comfortable accessing care with them, then you don't have an adequate network. What we need to do is dig down into our neighborhoods, understand the demographics and the culture, support the providers who are trusted there and find the sweet spot among all those things that drive further investment in those neighborhoods. Yeah. And for health plans and other organizations, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I totally agree. And I wanna build, I wanna dive into trust uh, because that's gonna be a part of today's discussion. I, I, you hit on it. Uh, and, and I'm going to bring you into when we talk about trust in, in, in a little while uh, and how the organizations on this panel are addressing it. I, I want to bring you back in because I think getting that provider strategy down is so key. You can't just, you got to be thinking about not only what the consumer is going to take, but also uh, what you're doing to, to, to get the providers into the community. So, uh, yeah, let, let, let's, let's, let's kind of pause it there, Marty, if you don't mind. And I want to bring you back into it in a moment into the conversation. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's, uh, I want to provide some examples or let, and, and how it all comes together and, and how you could bring an engagement with incentives, which we haven't yet uh, nailed down yet or even really talked about yet. So I'm going to bring in uh, Mary Ann Farrelly. She's the director of member experience at Highmark Health Options, Delaware Medicaid. And, and Mary Ann, could you just provide us maybe with an example of what you're doing in Delaware uh, that's, that's had some success. Let the group hear about it. Yeah, I'm happy to provide that example, Eric. And thanks for having me this afternoon. Um, and to be among this esteemed panel of guests is, is wonderful. Um, so we uh, struggled at health options with our uh, health risk assessments. It was a challenge for us, you know, the all important health risk assessment, getting, finding out, you know, what, are the, what is the member at risk of in their first um, 60 days when they're a new member? And we uh, were in the single digits. We were um, below 10%. And we are now at 42%. And we attribute that to a couple things. Uh, we definitely attribute to the fact that we uh, use um, Icario as an HRA vendor. And they are providing what uh, Corey and Dan refer to as that kind of behavioral uh, insight where we, uh, the members are targeted uh, with digital channels and live agents. So they can be tech, text, uh, um, email, snail mail, of course, and then uh, IVR calls, uh, uh, interactive voice calls, or live agents, which our members actually prefer. And our carrier actually helped us to realize that. They increased their um, number of live calls. We use live calls um, with in internally with our member advocates. And when they're on the call, they really engage with the member. They, as they answer the questions, it's not just checking a box of, you know, uh, do you have a, a, a primary care provider? No, okay, move on to the next question. They help them to provide a primary care provider in their area. They'll also help them with the questions around uh, finding if they're having some food insecurities or they, or they live in a food desert, finding food banks. So we, we keep the member on uh, the call uh, because sometimes they're rushing off the call. We engage them and we're able to get our 100% of our survey completed in order to assess whether they need to be placed into care coordination services. Do they need to be hooked up with a care coordinator or are they a member who may need some small, small assistance, but that prevents them from a hospitalization, a readmission, a, the disease progressing. Um, so we try to help them along the call. We've also added incentives. We've added a, a, a small gift card. That was at our uh, carrier's recommendation. We had thought of it previously, um, but they explained in uh, using the data that that does appeal to our members. So we're able to use a, a $10 gift card and it goes a long way with our members in, you know, we introduce it at the beginning of the call. Um, but, but again, our 
uh, I feel that our chief strategy is using that behavioral, those behavioral indicators, our member advocates, our clinical staff, and our uh, member service staff are trained to uh, key in on what the member needs. They know about what's available in Delaware as far as community-based resources. And we also have something called the community support uh, platform, which is a, which is a um, sort of like an Aunt Bertha, where they type in that zip code that Corey mentioned, and they're able to look at what is, is, uh, the, are the resources in that area and hook up that member. So it's a combination of those incentives, incentivizing the member to answer the questions and also helping them, helping them along the way, uh, we feel are the secrets to getting that health risk assessment completed and getting the member the services they need. All right, Mary, and that was, you're not, you're not done yet. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that have been thrown your way, and I think there are there's some good follow-ups that I would have asked. So uh, I'm going to ask them on their, on, on their, our guests, our guest's behalf. Uh, so first of all, uh, do you, and you may not know this, this is a little specific, but just let's throw it out there. For live calls, do you know what your average reach rate is? So we internally, uh, we reach out to members probably uh, three times at different times of the day and different days of the week. Um, we even have some um, uh, of our staff working overtime uh, after hours and on Saturdays in order to try to catch the member at different times. Um, so I don't know our reach rate and, and I carry a might, you know, might provide that, but we definitely um, have been able to out of our um population, we've been able to reach 42% of our new uh, member population, but that's after a lot of calls at, at the digital campaign, trying different methods. Um, but I can get back to the a panel on that. Okay. And follow up to that is a, cause you alluded to it, but I don't think it's clear yet. Is a cario providing the live call as well as the IVR or is the live call coming from Highmark's call center? So the live calls come from Highmark Health Options, but Acario, normally they, they use digital channels, the text, the email, the um, uh, regular mail and the uh, IVR calls and their IVR calls are human voice. So it's kind of human uh, interaction, um, but they also uh, use live calls. They, were, they use a small amount of live calls, but then as they realize that our members like to talk to someone on the phone. They may not answer, but when they do answer, they do like to talk to someone. Um, they, a carrier actually increased how many uh, live agents they were using. And they also started out with only reaching them out for a certain period. Now they outreach them the, the, the entire 60 days. So it's a great partnership. We meet with them weekly in order to strategize and change things up and, and really focus in on what works. That is great. Uh, I think the next uh, natural question here is how how is the overall concept of incentives built into this program? Uh, how was the incentive particularly chosen and, and how has it been effective and has there been any tests done with uh, outreach without incentive, outreach with incentive? Yeah, so our carrier recommended that at the beginning. They recommended, you know, uh, and we also did some focus groups. We uh, we have, um, and I was going to talk about that in a little bit, but we have a member advisory council, and we have members, uh, very loyal members, who are on that council. And we did some focus groups with them, uh, with the help of our um, product innovation team. And we asked them, you know, what what incentivizes them, on not only to attend our member advisory council, but also what incentivizes them to participate participate in these important surveys and the ten dollar you know gift card some some even said five dollars that was a sweet spot for them the ten dollars and we have seen a remarkable increase uh, like I said from we were in the single digits as of um, uh, uh, October of 2020 and now we're up to 42 percent uh, which was our last um, uh, last month's uh, rate do, do the gift cards vary by neighborhood or the entire program? I know you're, you're in a small state, but what's the gift card? It's a $10 Walmart gift card um, that we use. Because and with the rationale, like what was why, why Walmart? Because they don't allow them to purchase uh, firearms, tobacco, and um, uh, uh, I guess liquor is the other one. Okay. Yep. So okay. that was, was our choice with that. We use CVS gift cards as well. 
um, for the same kind of reasons. And we use that for our, our member advisory council. But the Walmart, you know, a lot of our members shop at Walmart. And that was something that, that always came up. And they said Walmart gift cards, not to be a plug for Walmart. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, the, gro- the grocery you aspect. You plugged you, you, you plug the Cario, Walmart, <laughs> and CVS. So, I mean, you're like a spokesperson. You must be getting like residuals. I'm just kidding. Uh, is, is the gift card physical or is it on, redeemed online? So we do send a physical gift card. Um, the members can use it online if they'd like. Um, I know that we do have a, a member reward, rewards program as well for, for filling care gaps. And that is an electronic card um, that our quality department will uh, send out a member and then they redeem that. And we, we were going to do that, but our members like to have that physical gift card. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Okay. We got to keep the post office in business. So, <laughs> and a uh, little bit of, as a segue, but uh, or off topic, but have you found a difference between your Medicaid and Medicare clients in terms of life calls? Do you have that data or are you just specific to Medicaid? I'm very specific to Medicaid. Okay, I thought so, but I wanted to make yeah, sure. Medicare doesn't have the same challenges I hear uh, with uh, me- reaching members on the line, getting them to stay on the call. You know, we'll reschedule a call. Uh, we will, you know, uh, kind of, we hear like a crying baby in the background. We'll say, is it a better time to call you? So we truly try to personalize and adapt to the, to the member situation. And we, and like I said, we've seen an increase in our health risk assessments. And we've also, uh, uh, since we started the gift cards, uh, six, about 6%, uh, when we look at our data, about 6% more of our uh, members have been placed in care coordination uh, and, and have been risk stratified because of that. So that's members that, you know, could, there could be some cost avoidance there with them going into the ER, uh, with them uh, um, not filling their medications, not filling their asthma medications, and also uh, a hospitalization. So we've seen some really good effects as far as cost avoidance and filling care gaps as well. Hey, Eric, just to chime in there, because I've worked with uh, Marianne and I actually used to run a lot of the Medicare work at Highmark. Uh, the average, it's around 10 to 15 raw percentage points better contact rate with the Medicare population than the Medicaid population. Yeah, I believe it. Great. Thanks, Dan. It's great. I forgot you were sitting back there. My bad. Great. Perfect. Uh, let, let me... Um, we're going to cover. So, what I want to do for for the the next thirty minutes is uh, get into trust, and then as we as we kind of come out of t- trust, thinking about uh, tying in incentives and and things that we want to avoid uh, when building these programs. For those in the audience that are thinking about either uh, reshaping or building or reshaping their current program, so we're going to cover some really interesting insights uh, and examples coming up in, in the last 30 minutes, but uh, I think this is a good place for me to pause. I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my friends at Acario. And since uh, Marianne has unprompted uh, teed them up uh, and promoted them a bit, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just jump on that for a moment and tell you a little bit more about them. I, as I mentioned in the onset, if you joined us late, they're a health action company that's uh, into deeply understanding people by using behavioral research and data science to, to move people to take action for better health, better health. So it's, it's a, they're a perfect fit to being part of this program and, and, and be uh, not only a thought leader on this program, but also a, a supporter of this, uh, this week's episode. I do want to tell you a little bit more about them because I mentioned a few things in my earlier remarks about pragmatic non-healthcare uh, thinking. So they, they, they reach they reach members uh, that need interventions the most by, you know, while at the same time, what I would say, driving low and moderately acutely members to action with these personal outreaches at scale. And what I meant by non-healthcare thinking is they take a very Madison Avenue approach to understanding different consumers' values. So when you think about the specific words that are used to inspire your own behavioral change, whether you're watching a game on the television or or a, a show, and you think about all the brands that we purchase and continue to purchase and think of, Coke and Apple and Tesla and Target, and we could go on, Walmart. So these companies, they drive us as consumers to a behavior and, and it's ultimately to purchase uh, and consume their brands. And, and although uh, their words in advertising are different from what uh, we as healthcare folks uh, need to go out there and sell, the principles are the same. And we need to sort of get with 
some of the things that have been done in our sister industries. And so when you want to move the needle in pop health and value-based care, I think it starts about thinking differently about engagement and how you think about the individual consumer. And, and that's why I suggest, I'm not saying you want to hire consultants to do that per se just yet, although I doubt most of you have organizations that have an in, in-house capability, but I do think it makes sense to reach out to guys like Corey and, and, and just pick their brain and have exploratory calls uh, because they know uh, a lot about this and they do it differently. And it's just a great opportunity to pick their eye, pick their brain for ideas. So, so that's my sort of pitch to all of you. And, and yes, they are a sponsor of the show. So I completely have bias here, but I just believe the reason I do this show, as everyone knows, is to start talking about bright spots and ways that we could all share ideas and, and, and make healthcare a better place for not only us, but our children and our children's children. And I think we need to consume, uh, engage chronically ill folks better and folks that maybe don't look like us and live in our neighborhoods. We need to be able to understand them better and, and do it in a way that's empathetic, trustworthy. And I just encourage you to network and learn from folks that are just look at it from a different perspective. So they're at acariohealth.com in the feedback form. You could request me to make a personal introduction to Corey or someone uh, on his team that you could just talk to and learn more about this stuff. Cause I think it's super important for all of us. All right. Enough of the, the commercial, although it's, 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 it's not just a commercial. Uh, I want to, I want to get back into our questions and cover the last 30, 29 minutes, 30 minutes here with, with some of these topics. So Corey, I'll let you go. Uh, let's talk about the difference between traditional healthcare management and the more sophisticated individualized approach to consumer activation. And, and uh, let's talk about that specifically and we'll dive into there and then move into trust because I think it'll be a nice segue. Sure. Uh, so I think, I think Mary Ann <clears throat> hit on it, uh, hit it on it spot on because what she was talking about was really channel differentiation and, and the multitude of channels that we can use in order to activate members to take action. Because I think in, in most cases, I, I come from a background that includes work at a health plan. I worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Minnesota for a number of years. And it, you know, it wasn't until, it, you, you mentioned it, it's the, it's the Madison Avenue uh, type of approach that health plans are just now kind of getting to. Back in 2012, when I was working at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Minnesota, we but, you know, I hate to say it, we weren't really thinking about the individualized member. We were thinking about populations writ large, right? We were talking about blocks of population, mostly employer or, or government programs. But the discrete individual member was not really on the health plan's radar up until the advent of three things. The increase in sort of the, the consumerization of everything, right? Uh, Amazon uh, basically taught us all how to be better consumers or, or more active consumers anyway. That included healthcare. The, uh, the, the, the okay by the Supreme Court of the Affordable Care Act that said, yeah, this can go through. And that individualized coverage uh, was tantamount to a, a sea change in health plans. Um, along the same moment was occurring um, uh, stars in, in Medicare Advantage. All of this had a lot to do with now members are, are rating us. And it, it, what it effectively did was change the, the, the lens from member experience and member choice being marketing's problem to everybody's problem, everybody on this call and everybody you know, in, in health plans around the country. So I, I think, like I say, most plans sort of stop at that first level of, of data, that clinical view of their member. Um, and uh, some go to that next uh, piece of segmentation, right? Where, um, well, women are gonna need breast cancer screenings and men aren't, so we'll segment our population, we'll cut it in half. And now this, this set of members will get a communication that is uniquely geared toward women um, and this will be more of a broad-based uh, uh, communication that is, is for everybody, for, for broader consumer uh, con uh, consumption. It's that next level, those next couple of levels that are really the next phase and where we need to be as, as an industry. And I say we as, you know, as healthcare overall, because that next phase is creating those discrete uh, bits of content that aren't to, uh, to, to, I think it was Dan who said, uh, perhaps it was Marty, it's not enough simply to translate, to simply take what your content is in English and translate it into Spanish or to uh, Tagalog or to Russian or whatever. Um, any, any language that is a member's first language is the language in which they want to interact with you. This is one of the things that we've learned in our experience is that even when members identify as bilingual or multilingual, 
Um, the, the easy step, of course, the path of least resistance for most health, most health plans is to communicate with those members in English because that's where the bulk of our, our content is. But what we've learned uh, in our experience at Acario is that when members self-identify as multilingual and they have a first language that is not English, um, reaching out to that member first in that first language and not defaulting to English gets far better traction and builds that trust that you were talking about, Eric, between the health plan, because everything that we do is private label, is, is, is white labeled. So it, it reads Highmark, it reads Gateway. Um, and so it, uh, the, the members are engaging with that at a high, much higher rate than if you start with English, because even when a member has, has identified as multilingual. Um, in addition, it's identifying those things that are going to prompt members to take action that go beyond uh, simple educational content, which is where, again, as, as health plans, most of us default to. It's do this because these reasons. Um, almost the, the standard features and benefits type of discussion with, a, with an average member. But what's really motivating to them, in addition to rewards and incentives, which are in, a, in and of themselves a tool to activate members to get, to, to get them to take action. But what can be equally motivating are the words. Um, one of my fellow panelists said before, uh, the reason, I think it was Dan, who said the reason that I, I focus on the words uh, is because words matter. Because what the, we're often doing is we're motivating members who are, um, well, uh, uh, they're interested in, in key facets like norming. Everybody is doing it, so I should do this too. Members who are motivated by norming are different than members who are motivated by social impact. I wanna get my flu shot because I wanna avoid giving the flu to my family and friends or at my school or at my workplace. Um, Trade-offs and other community types of, of uh, components to the language that we use to talk to our members, build that trust and allow us to communicate more credibly and authentically with community capital C in, uh, in those environments that, that uh, permeate multiple facets of our health plans. Courtney, when you mentioned granular data, can you provide an example? I, I, I would say language is probably not necessarily granular data, at least as I would interpret it. But when you think about granular data, like uh, distance from a primary care uh, practice or, or, or primary care in general clinic, how do you, can you provide an example of how you take that data and apply it, and maybe if there's an example specifically that you could tell us about? Sure, so in using the example that I, I painted before where health plans will start with a clinical view, if we're taking two male Medicaid beneficiaries who are about the same age and they both have uh, type two diabetes and they both live in rural, insert your state here, right? So we know, this is what, this is what we know at, at the clinical level um, from the health plan, male type two diabetes, Medicaid beneficiaries um, in, a particular, uh, in a particular geographic area. What we know about Corey is that he lives 40 miles from uh, a healthcare facility, whereas Eric is within walking distance, or at least, you know, let's, let's even say 10 miles from a, uh, from, from a facility. These are, are, are common uh, benchmarks that, that health plans have been using for a long time, time and distance to a healthcare facility. What this allows us to get deeper into though, is what those potential barriers to care might be for an individual member. Is that member, does that member have, uh, own a car? And can they get to, uh, even if, if you're 40 miles away, if you have a car, it's a heck of a lot easier to get there. Um, if not, if you are, uh, if you are, are homebound um, and living alone, um, and uh, we're, we're trying to communicate with you in, in English, but that is not your first language, all of these create additional barriers to care so that motivating me to take action is actually uh, maybe disincenting or demotivating me because what all you're doing is pointing out to me all of the barriers that are in my way to getting the care that you're prompting me to take. So understanding that um, and identifying for that member who is a long distance away and has transportation insecurity or uh, other barriers to care, transportation, let's just pick on that one for the moment, um, identifying the transportation benefit within a plan to that member who has already been identified or you can conceivably understand would have difficulty getting to a, uh, a, a clinical setting of any kind um, is tantamount to success. Uh, reminding that, that member that there are transportation benefits, reminding that, that, that member of the fact that you have telehealth benefits 
that uh, they, they could employ in order to cover off on some of these things that you're asking them to do, as opposed to the old mindset of being seen means presenting yourself physically in a clinical setting of your primary care doc who happens to be a long way away compared to that member who is much nearer a clinical setting for whom the options are much, much broader and the obstacles may be much, much lower um, and their likelihood to, to activate and, and engage in those types of activities is much, much higher. Great. I, I want to stick with the theme of storytelling here. And, and Dan, I'm going to bring you in and maybe can we, I'm going to stay with trust too, because I think this is paramount to this whole anyone's strategy working. How can you ensure that uh, you're building trust with your consumers and just you're maybe providing a story or, of how you, you've been able to do that and, and get folks closer into the community to, to, to build that bond? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks, Eric. That's a great question. Um, one of the things I'd say uh, that I'd highlight that we've done is we've really, as I mentioned earlier, try to focus in on that community level. Um, I think it was Marty that was talking about the importance of the provider engagement uh, a program that we launched back uh, late in 19 that we started to really focus on right before the pandemic struck was a partnership in some of our communities with EMT services. So we started using, you know, paramedics as a sort of bridge, almost in a, you know, community health worker kind of capacity to engage with members who were what we like to call frequent flyers, folks that have been in and out of the hospital at least five times within the last six months. Um, and, you know, I've had an engagement or a hospitalization recently, we really tried to target a different type of interaction with them. Uh, when you talk about trust, there is there's a value there because this is a locally branded company. Um, you know, you're thinking about the, you know, ambulances that are driving around in their community. It's a name that they see. It's a free marketing for your partner. Um, there, there, there's a trust element there because it is localized to them. With the program as an example, um, you know, they started to come provide some basic services at the home, check in with people after their discharges and, and, and provide things that they weren't getting, just checking in on them, making sure that they were following their, you know, uh, discharge instructions, that they had access, taking basic readings to make sure that somebody, you know, wasn't in need of some type of care that they weren't seeking because they felt fine, whatever. And across that population, um, on average, we saw almost a two and a half visit across a six month period reduction. So 76% of the people, you know, in general, uh, saw four ED drop over a six month period. These were people that had been in the hospital at least five times in the prior six month period. So they saw a four ED drop in six months. 26% of the people actually saw a two and a half ED visit increase over the next six months. Um, and that was because there were exacerbating things that they needed to get addressed. But overall, as a group, collectively, you saw a significant reduction there in those ED visits. Um, and I think a lot of that came from the fact that we were partnering with those local groups, um, people that they had a community level of trust with, um, and somebody they'd call on normally. If there's an emergency situation, you're calling 911 and they're sending an ambulance to your house. So, Yeah, I, that's, that, I, I love that. Absolutely love that. Uh, I'm looking at the questions, folks. I'm going to try to sprinkle some of these more into the uh, conversation. I know we're getting tight on time. Uh, so I'm going to bounce around here for my panelists. Uh, we're, we're talking about trust. We're trying to get closer to the community. I know, Marianne, you had mentioned earlier, you alluded to your to your council, uh, your member council. Can you talk a little bit more about it and how those, you're using the council to uh, promote higher rates of COVID vaccination and just in general, how you're engaging them, getting them involved, using their information, keeping them involved. And uh, while you're doing that, what I want to also offer up to folks. So uh, there's a really interesting short read uh, by our friends at Acario on seven essential strategies for engaging and motivating medical Medicaid members. Uh, so we could send that to you directly rather than you have to fill out a form or anything like that. Uh, we have their permission, so we have a copy of it. If you want me to shoot that out in an email to you um, after the show, just uh, we're going to put up a quick poll. You don't need, yes, yeah, so and we'll just quickly shoot you out a, a PDF with it, and you'll and you'll at least have a copy of that, and you can review it at your leisure. So, Marianne, why don't you, while that's up, if you could just tell us a little bit about how you're leveraging the council, incentivizing them to drive COVID vaccinations? Yep, sure, Eric. So we have a, a member advisory council. We invite members, we have uh, uh, care coordinators, case managers, 
Member services all recommend members to our um, uh, monthly meeting of the state participates in that. Um, and also uh, the staff. So members uh, join, we have about probably six to nine members and we are actually, uh, member services is highlighting our me member advisory council on, a, on their calls this month. So we're, we have lots of uh, recommendations for new members. And what they do is they participate in um, the, looking at our programs, any new programs, and also making uh, suggestions. So we had a member who was homebound. I think uh, probably six of our nine members of the council right now are homebound. And, and she was struggling with getting COVID vaccinations in the home. She was afraid to go out and we were, she was able to make some calls. We were able to make some calls with her use of her uh, case manager and they were able to get um, her COVID vac vaccinations in the home. And then she shared that with the other members. So it's a great way that our members can comment on our programs, improve our services to them. Uh, we we uh, use those same members for focus groups. They get a gift card for participating in focus groups. They get gift cards for being on the, the council. It's, it's an hour of their time, actually an hour and a half of their time. So we want to reward them for that. And we don't just want people to be on the council to get a gift card. They really care. Uh, our um, members will uh, give us valuable information. We'll use it and they'll see it in action. And they really uh, that makes them feel really good about helping their peers, helping uh, helping others that are in the same situation. Then we also want to share those stories, and we have a, a um, quarterly meeting of all of Highmark and Highmark Inc. And we share member we take member testimonials of those same members about their experience with our health plan, about their experience with uh, the the council, and how they've made improvements from their suggestions. Uh, so I feel, really feel that. Uh, their participation, they feel their participation is really influencing what we do in the program. And I, I just wanted to comment on Corey and all of his talking about the social determinants of health and how important that is and that we address those. When we um, are in meetings and when we are talking about new programs and what we should cover, what, what uh, new um, uh, incentives and rewards and uh, programs we should have, benefits we should have, we are, are always considering the social determinants of health of our members. So Marianne, very quickly though, uh, I, I, it, it strikes me, uh, it is really, the companies that are gonna go and be the ones that are doing this in the 99th percentile, like, you know, we all think we're in the upper 90th percentile, right? When we're in our jobs, right? Probably not true, that's impossible. But when you really wanna be the best at building trust and relating to uh, Medicaid consumers in this case, because that's the conversation we're having, uh, you need to be even thinking about your overall strategy tied to people and who you hire. And it struck me when we were meeting uh, for this show, uh, can you just share your background and why this role is so important to you? Uh, because I think your role, your title, and your background is exactly the example of how health plans and providers and anyone else needs to move the needle in Medicaid. So for in a couple of minutes, just can you give us that? Yeah, sure. So I am a Medicaid baby. So I, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, I was a single mom, and I was, you know, we were a product of Medicaid. And we, um, you know, uh, my brother, my sister and I are all college educated and really worked up through the ranks. And, you know, uh, Highmark Health Options offers um, help with a, a GED program. I don't know if I mentioned that to you, Eric, but we will pay for a review course, and they're taking their GED so that, you know, members can uh, possibly Get, you know, get a uh, get, uh, improve their career, get a, uh, get a uh, job, and get off Medicaid. So I, you know, what attracted me? I've worked for healthcare providers in the tri-state area, and I of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and Maryland. And I, you know, was attracted to working for Medicaid because of giving back where I came from. So I feel like, um, you know, our our members are um, what I went through. And I feel like my role of director member experience really is a pinnacle of my career in trying to improve their, their um, status in life and that there are, uh, in addition to their healthcare outcomes. Uh, so there, there's something when you think about your hiring. Uh, uh, let's talk about the docs and the nurses and the social workers, Marty, and bring you back in. You know, how are you uh, going into the community uh, and, and partnering with the clinics to drive meaningful relationships with the, with the Medicaid population? 
Well, yeah, first of all, and I know we've been talking about this, you can't overstate the importance of trust in this because people just simply won't engage with something they don't trust. And I think sometimes we get, you know, um, with, with our planning reports and acronyms and every, everything, we, we tend to lose sight of that simple reality. Um, and here, I think COVID offers a, another great insight. You know, once the vaccine started rolling out around here, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that local vaccination events were much more successful when they were sponsored by and participated in by trusted local providers. Um, we saw a real difference in, in the, um, the clinics that, that had a local provider on site that, that was helping to promote it and those that didn't. And if, if we're most effective with trusted providers working in the community to promote to promote COVID vaccines, um, you know, what part of that do we draw forward? You know, should trusted providers be carrying more of our public health messaging? Should they be working harder or should we be working harder to foster direct connections between local clinics and community-based support agencies to get to those social determinants that, that Mary Ann mentioned? Um, should we, should certain providers be utilized as ambassadors for our programming? It's, it's really looking at ways to move beyond the provider patient relationship into the provider healthcare health system relationship in ways that we're not utilizing them yet. I think COVID really showed us, you know, certainly through these vaccine clinics that that they trust a provider, especially in the communities and the neighborhoods that we want to target makes all the difference in the world for people trusting that event, um, what they're being told and what's going on. Right, yeah. So we really want to find ways to move, move forward with that as we move beyond COVID. Okay. Last nine minutes or so, possibly the most important part of this discussion, folks. So grab a pen and paper. I want to talk about things that have not worked and failures. So uh, Dan, let's come on in. What's an example of an incentive program that has not worked? A uh, great example is a uh, prenatal program we had uh, in our maternity focus. Um, you know, we had an incentive that we specifically were focused on because our state uses a variety of uh, prenatal and uh, maternal measures in their paper performance program. Um, the original program, we used to incentivize with non-monetary activities. You know, we were offering things like, you know, a car seat, um, you know, a supply of diapers for an extended period of time, um, some other types of tangible items like that. Um, and we weren't seeing the participation that we were expecting. So, um, you know, through member engagement, uh, you know, focus group, that type of work to try and understand what would change uh, the picture, what would motivate them. We actually shifted the program to a more generic monetary uh, incentive, you know, just a basic gift card, like a visa, et cetera. Because for that population, what we were running into is people that had prior children. So they had an old car seat that they could use and didn't feel the, see the value there. They had an old crib um, or they had, you know, people giving them diapers from, you know, say a church, uh, you know, a baby shower or something. So they needed uh, or, or saw the value, I guess I would say from the incentive as opposed to some tangible item. So we had to shift that program. And then we saw about a 20% uptick in actual participation after we did that. And Eric, do you, mind, do you mind if I jump in for just a second? Because I think what what uh, what, what Dan is saying is is absolutely spot on with what we have seen too. Probably more than anything else, I think that we see is that we get so wrapped up in programs and return on uh, return or, or at least cost and budgets and so on that we forget that at the heart of these programs are people. And what is probably one of the biggest motivators for for people is the aspect, particularly those who might be in a position where they're, they're Medicaid beneficiaries, is the, the concept of choice. And so being able to provide members with uh, something as simple as a gift card to a retailer of their choice. You know, Marianne mentioned Walmart. It's, it's one of multiple choices that are available to, to members. Walmart happens to be a, a pretty popular one because of the, the, the bevy of things that you can get there. But offering members a choice is tantamount to success as well, because so often uh, all of the reasons that Dan gave are absolutely reasons that members might not be motivated by a, a merchandise type of program, but offering them the choice where they not only get the choice of, of gift card, but then the choice of how to spend it is, is, is giving back to individuals, people at the heart of these programs, back that choice and back that uh, empowerment and that agency in order to make decisions for themselves instead of my health plan told me to. 
great. I, I, guys, uh, I'm going to go around the room and there's a couple of tactical questions from the group here that I want to get out there and, and see if we could quickly answer. Uh, yeah, Eric, there's one in the chat. Okay. I don't mean to interrupt you. There's one in the chat that I'd love to answer. It's something we talked about as well. It's about cultivating a team that kind of mirrors the members. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, you know, we have done that at Highmark we, uh, Health Options where, you know, we're, we have, we uh, are hiring uh, some temporary workers uh, to help us with our HRA rates and they are reflective of our membership. They understand our membership. So they may be single moms. I mean, we, these are the mem these are uh, continued workers that, you know, actually were interested in doing this. So I, I saw a question about, you know, does anyone have experience with cultivating a team from their existing membership who who look like, act like, sound like a typical member. Yes, I think that that is very effective. I know that other um, uh, uh, call centers have you know kind of recommended that when we've talked to them. Uh, but I do I do think that that you know when you train them and they're reflective of your uh, membership and understand your membership, the members can really relate to them and will actually you know just like uh, you know a nurse and that we would have you know people talk to other uh, patients. And they would follow their, you know, take their insulin, you know. So I think that when you can relate to the member, really, they and they trust you again. That trust again, you're going to get the health health outcomes that you uh, want to see. Nice, nice, nice interjection there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to keep you on the spot here, and then Corey, uh, maybe you jump in. Uh, if what's the guidelines about the total dollar amount of incentives that could be delivered to a Medicaid beneficiary in a given year? Uh, Marianne, do you have that? So um, the guidelines around incentives. The dollar amount. Yeah. So I, um, I'm gonna have to look up that yeah. one. Maybe Dan is for, aware for, of what Dan that or is. Dan or Corey, do you have that yeah. for us? Generally speaking, the the incentive can't be more than the cost of what is being asked of the member to to get done. So I'll, I'll use um, uh, the annual physical or annual wellness visit as an as an example. Um, the the value of an incentive cannot exceed what. The, uh, the, the cost of an annual wellness visit would be. That's right. largely the, the, the parameter around Medicaid. In Medicare, there are additional rules that often get confused. Uh, what, what, what often gets mixed up is that there are different rules for rewards and incentives where that follow that can't be more than the, the cost of the procedure that get conflated with uh, the, the nominal gifts uh, language that's in the Medicare marketing manual. Um, that's say $15 per activity, no more than $75 per member per year. Those are strictly related to those things that fall into your marketing category. When we're talking about rewards and incentives for clinical programs, that's actually in your MLR spend. So very, very different treatment and very, very different definitions per CMS. Yeah, and I was glad to see that uh, Jason Landers is on, first of all, that he chimed in on the side. Um, there are rules that do vary by state. Eric is the answer. So Delaware has different rules than Pennsylvania, than West Virginia, et cetera. And they do usually put some form of a cap on the total amount that you can spend um, for any individual Medicaid member. To the best of my knowledge, I'll be honest, I'm not aware of a household limit that is greater than just the, you know, uh, the sum of all of the eligible household people. Um, because I saw that in the queue as well. Yeah. Um, most states do allow us some flexibility there. You know, as an example, we can send a gift card to the parents of an underage child as opposed to sending a gift card to the underage child. Yeah. Well, we got three quarters of the questions from the audience answered. Corey, do you want to close us out in the last minute and a half here? Uh, any final not to do examples? Um, I, I think I got three. Um, Things that we see uh, uh, a lot in rewards and incentives programs um, that I think a lot of, of plans take for granted. One, individual dollar amounts matter, but there is just as much art as science involved in that, right? So what you're asking your members to do, if you're attaching a reward and incentive to it, if you're attaching a reward value to it, let, let's use gift cards for just a moment, right? A dollar value. Um, Simply choosing a dollar value that runs the gamut of everything you're asking a member to do often is inadequate because we all know that it is far more invasive to get a colonoscopy than it is to get a flu shot. So you can often tailor your rewards and incentives based on the, the level of the ask that you're making of the member. Um, we have seen no discernible difference in the difference between a $25 and a $50 uh, gift card for things like diabetic eye exams um, there's no difference in the, the utilization that we see. 
there is a big difference when you, you take that uh, colorectal cancer screening between 20 and $50 or 25 and $50. More members are going to close more gaps at the $50 level because of the, 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 the level of the ask you're making. Second, um, aggregate reward value matters. If you're asking members to do more than one thing and you are appending multiple dollar values to it, if you're asking Corey as a member to get his annual wellness visit, his diabetic eye exam, his colorectal cancer screening and a flu shot, those programs perform better than asking Corey to do any one of those things individually, regardless of how much you're offering me in order to go get it done. So a hundred dollar annual wellness visit in isolation is not gonna perform as well as those four or five activities that total a hundred dollars. And plus you're getting more care gaps closed. And last but not least, resist the, the temptation to reward everybody for everything. So many times what we see are health plans that say we have, uh, we, we, we do all this. We have a reward and incentive program in place. It's claims-based. We trigger our rewards based on the fact that three months ago, Corey went in and got his colorectal cancer screening. We just got around to processing that claim, issued the gift card. Corey has no idea why he's getting that gift card. Um, instead, target the, uh, the rewards and incentives based on those members who are historically non-compliant. Those members who haven't covered off on those care gaps are the ones really that you're after because you have a host of members who are going to do those things anyway. Um, it's better for the members and frankly, it's better for the bottom line. Wow, great. Um, stick around here for a second, folks, uh, on the panel. I want to just to our audience listening and watching, uh, we're about a minute over, um, so I'm going to close things out. Please fill out that feedback form. Thank you again. I don't take the 60 minutes that you spend with us, whether you're walking and listening to the podcast or live at your office or home watching this. Thank you so much for the time. And uh, we will uh, see you at our next show. This will mark the end of today's episode. Have a great rest of your day. And to our esteemed panel, thank you so much. Stick around for just for a second. Really appreciate all the time you took.